Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views and trends from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host Chris Pareja and this evening I'm joined by Assemblyman Tim Donnelly. Uh, not only is he an Assemblyman, but I'm going to give him the extra title of Explorer for this evening's show and we'll explain a little bit more about that in just a short while. Tim, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. We appreciate the opportunity to have an assemblyman out here in the wild uh, bringing back word from Sacramento about how crazy things are there. Talk to us about what you're seeing and uh, things that you're excited about, as well as some of the stuff that's a little bit more broken right now. Well, if it's a Monday, a Tuesday, or a Wednesday, they're either increasing taxes on gasoline, guns, or your income. They're, they're actually coming up with a tax on unemployment. They, they, they want to raise the tax on working people to pay off the debt to the federal government of $10 billion for extending unemployment benefits. It's, uh, it, they're trying to deprive Californians of the Second Amendment. They, they have a bill, AB 711, to ban hunting by banning lead ammunition. Um, every which way you look, Sacramento is trying to take away another one of your freedoms. It has become really the biggest impediment to your life, your liberty, your, your livelihood. Your, it, it's got people, whole flock, people are flocking to leave California to find a better life. I mean, this, is, this, is, this hasn't happened in generations. It's, it's sort of anti-Californian. Well, I, I do have to stop you and just ask, are they afraid that the lead in bullets might kill animals if they're hit with them? <laughs> oh, what, what's the rationale? Well, it, it, they, they claim it's a big environmental problem because a, a random bullet here or there gets in a stream. But really, every time they go after one of these uh, little tiny aspects of the Second Amendment, it's really a backdoor way of trying to erase the Second Amendment. Right. And if you ban lead, and there's already a federal ban on all other types of bullets. If it's non-lead, it's basically armor piercing. And if it can be fired through a handgun, then in most rifle rounds today can, uh, then you wouldn't be able to use it. So therefore, you have the government rendering something you lawfully purchased mm -hmm. completely useless. So yeah. it's almost like an unconstitutional taking. Right. I mean, the, the things they're doing are really affecting Californians. I, I've talked to a business owner that pays a half a million dollars in, in state income tax. You know what he told me? He said the biggest complaint I have about California isn't the high taxes. It's not the, the regulations, even though those are a disaster. Mm -hmm. He said, I love California. He said, but I, I bought 600 acres in Texas because if they take away the Second Amendment and I can no longer defend my, my family and my life, I'm out of here. Right. Well, and, and they're not just taking away bullets. And in that particular case, it's like, okay, you can still have your guns. You just can't load them with anything. Uh, that, that's problematic. But also they're doing things, and I'm not sure if you're tracking SB1 at all, but they're looking at, you were talking about illegal takings, the ability to consider something blighted if it's a quote-unquote inefficient land use pattern. And we've got maniacs here in the Bay Area who believe that if it's a suburb or a rural area, that's an inefficient land use pattern. Yeah. You're basically looking at eminent domain being unleashed upon anyone they disagree with. Well, w what you're referring to is Agenda 21 that has, in, in the Bay Area, it's called One Bay Area. In other parts of the state, it has other names, but it's equally insidious, and it's ultimately tyranny. Right. It, it, it is the taking of private property by the government one of, the, one of the ways in which most people don't believe this when they hear it and they roll their eyes, but um, I, I, until they did the cap and trade, it was harder to track it. Mm -hmm. But once they did the cap and trade program, basically they're confiscating capital mm -hmm. from business owners right. that could be used to grow or expand that business, possibly hire people. Hire people. Crazy. Wow. I mean, we <laughs> have millions of people out of work here in California, one of the right. highest unemployment rates in the country. And, and, and yet they want to they levy what is and ought to be an illegal tax. Right. And, and they take this money and then they, they, they run it through this quasi-government corporation that has no transparency. It's completely mm -hmm. exempt from, from the Brown Act and, and any kind of uh, accountability. Mm -hmm. and, and they run it through these little uh, innocent-sounding government agencies. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, they're, they're buying the farmland from the farmers who can no longer farm because they starved them of water mm -hmm. and 
and as soon as they buy up the farmland, it's now been taken out of private property and private use, so it can no longer produce food. Right. They're just going to let it go fallow, and then they take the water rights and they sell them to a municipality, essentially forcing generations of of Californians off of the rural lands, right. and, and they want them to live in the stack and pack housing. Yeah. Well, the good news is they are letting some farmers have more access to water, like in Siskiyou County, where they're removing the dams, which is going to flood the farms for the for the ranchers, which is a completely opposite extreme. You know, the, the purpose of government, if you read the Declaration of Independence, is to secure our rights. Right. It is basically to defend our freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we talk about the inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are our natural rights that, right. that preceded government. And when government becomes destructive of those ends, we the people have a right to alter or abolish it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a huge majority of people that as they become aware, and, and oftentimes they don't become aware until the government comes knocking at their door. Right. Um, in, in the case, I, I, I have talked to you before about, about uh, CPS, Child mm -hmm. Protective Services. That was uh, going to be one of my next questions. Well, Thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I wasn't patient enough to let you just throw it out. but. Um, they snatched a baby away from a mother because she wanted a second medical opinion. So tell us a little bit about the story because it will put some people's hair at risk of being ripped out when you tell it. Oh yeah. Well, the the mother went to the hospital because her baby had a, had a, 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 a well we don't know if it was an infection, but he had a fever and he's five months old. He had a weak heart, so they knew there was a possibility he was going to need open heart surgery. The doctors had done things that made her lose confidence, and. As she was preparing to leave the hospital and try to get a second opinion, they said, you need to do open heart surgery right now. And, and, and she just said, that's it. I'm taking my baby. They brought in a government agent known as a CPS social worker who told her, you're free to leave, but your baby isn't. This mother went to a second hospital. She just grabbed her baby. She was not going to mess around with this. They sent a police officer after her. At the second hospital, the police officer said, hey, look, this mother is 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 seeking medical care there's no crime here and and he just went home he reported to cps and that should have been the end of the story and the next day five police officers were dispatched to her door they didn't have a warrant she called her husband her husband came home they tackled him on the front porch stole the keys out of his pocket broke into their home but this woman being from a country she she's german and her husband's russian being from countries where a knock on the door by authorities often meant people disappeared, she was very skeptical, so she rolled a video camera. And you watch as five police officers walk in with their hands on their guns. And, and, and you hear a police officer say, you know what, if you don't give us your baby, we're going to arrest you and, and, and book you for resisting arrest. Now, this, is, this is the United States of America. You know what, when they were leaving, she finally gave up her baby because they were going to rip it out of her arms. and. and and her little son, baby Sammy's going off with the social worker, and she says to the social worker, where are you taking my baby? You know, what any mother would ask. Right. And they, the social worker turned around and said, you don't get to know because you're acting irrationally. What unbridled power this agency has. And I began demanding answers and wanting to know. And by the way, they took the baby back to the hospital she had lost confidence in. So if you, if you, if you have any concerns or fears about the government getting more deeply involved in health care decisions. Here's a perfect prime example. But ultimately, I demanded some answers. I, I started calling at the local level and got all the way up to the department mm -hmm. head, Sherry Heller, and, and basically the answer to me was, we don't answer to anyone. We, we operate behind a shroud of secrecy and, and we have absolute confidentiality and we have absolute power. They don't need a, a warrant to invade somebody's home. They can bring the police in. The police need a warrant, but if they're with CPS, they can actually come into your home. And, and it's unbelievable. They separated this family for 30 days. And, and, and yet in another county, in Los Angeles County, they never even followed up on a case, another CPS unit of a little boy named Gabriel Fernandez who was brutally beaten to death by his stepfather and the mother so, so you have a government agency that has the power to essentially save a child from imminent criminal abuse or neglect, and yet they're going after mothers who want a second opinion. They're, they're taking kids because the, the, the refrigerator's empty or the house is dirty. They're, I've held hearings around the state, and there's so many people who have been affected by this one agency, 
And what's amazing is when I wrote this little letter and I put it up on Facebook, I got 27,000 people who said they want Tim Donnelly to run for president, all because I spoke out on their behalf. Right. In, you know, in the Russian community. And I said, no, I'm only running for governor. <laughs> well, that would explain the explorer title that I gave you earlier. So you've been doing a little bit exploring because a lot of times as citizens, we can get frustrated with the way Sacramento's working. We can get frustrated with the way Washington's working. You were frustrated enough before to run for assembly, and now you've been exploring a gubernatorial run. And so, you know, the, the question of what are you going to do about it doesn't even ap apply. I mean, it's obvious you're, you're willing to go out and do what it takes to get things changed. But what makes somebody crazy enough to run for governor? What would you do if the world were yours, or at least the state, to change things? Well, you know, as I said earlier, the, the purpose of government is to increase our freedom. It is to defend and protect the personal individual liberty of every citizen. Mm -hmm. And right now, most Californians and most Americans think that the government is the gravest threat to their liberty. And it is the greatest impediment to their success. The state needs to do a U-turn. Mm -hmm. The very first thing I would do is take these confiscatory taxes and and to steal a line from Steve Forbes, we need a flat tax. Right. We have this progressive tax where we penalize productive people. We mm -hmm. penalize people who are success, mm -hmm. successful, and and we reward mediocrity. So right there, that that would be that would be sort of the model for everything. Why don't we align the financial incentives with what we want? Mm -hmm. So if we lower tax rates, and and get more people working. Then, then we're taking people off of the expense side of the ledger. We're, we're getting them to work. That's better for society as a whole anyway. Right. Um, we need to do the same thing in the educational system. Mm -hmm. We need real school choice. We need education reform here mm -hmm. where we put the kids first. Now you're talking crazy. You, you actually want the education system to pay off for kids? You know, <laughs> people, people say that, 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 that your child's future is determined by their zip code, and they're right. We have They're schools that are yeah. failing, and, and, and the government has, has everyone locked in. Yeah. He, they talk about locking down the schools when there's, when there's a, you know, an active shooter on campus. Well, heck, they, they've got to lock down an opportunity. Right. If your school's failing, you can't leave because they need your kids but in that seat so that they can build the federal government. Right. Once again, why are our, fi our financial incentives always aligned with failure? Right. Well, I mean, if you look at it, it, there comes a point where you have to ask yourself, even if you're on the emergency uh, side of things on an airplane, the first thing they tell you to do is put on your own ma air mask, because if you suffocate, you're of no use to anyone else. That's right. But here we are in California, about 12% of the country's population and a third of the welfare cases. That's right. We're at two and a half times the number of welfare recipients. We have the government competing with small business owners, paying people not to work. We're driving California into bankruptcy. We're $10 billion at the starting gate in arrears to the federal government for keeping people on unemployment. People wouldn't need to be on unemployment so long if we got the economy growing again. It's like growth is a dirty word in this state. Yeah. You know, the newspapers right now are in love with Jerry Brown. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at his record, all he has done is raise our taxes to the highest income tax level in the entire country. Mm -hmm. We have sales tax that, that are that are outright confiscatory. Mm -hmm. And every time you turn around, he's coming up with another tax. Right. And, and and the average person who's working for a living can't keep up. Yeah. And they don't feel like they're getting what they pay for. The schools are perennially underfunded. Mm -hmm. The the music and art programs are always cut. Mm -hmm. Why are we cutting music and art instead of administrators? We have virtually a one-to-one -one ratio administrator to teacher. Why don't we cut administrators? Why don't we reduce the bloated bureaucracy? Why don't we eliminate the Department of Education in Sacramento instead of, instead of cutting always on the local level where it matters the most and it hurts the most? Well, you've got to be compliant with all the federal and state mandates, right? You need all the bureaucracy. Well, that's the other thing. We need to do a serious overhaul. We have, we pass about, we put forth about 2,500 new laws somewhere around 600 become law every year, depending on who the governor is, we need to be repealing laws. We need to be moving back toward a more free society. Did you know California used to be the freest state in the, in the union? That was probably in the days when we made money, though. <laughs> that's so outdated, right? <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's going to be the key to bringing California back. Yeah. And You know, I think there's an awful lot of people out there, and I don't think it matters whether you're right or left, mm -hmm. because this real question is a question of right or wrong. Right. There's a lot of people that love California. Yes. I came here 
I fell in love with California. And I'm watching her be, be destroyed and strangled by an overreaching government that is nothing more than really the killer of our dreams. The California dream is at risk for, for future generations. We have young people who are leaving our state because they can't even get classes. They can't even get seats in, in our schools anymore. Well, they're, they're actually the third priority. If you look at the way that the UC system is set up as an example, it's most profitable to bring people from out of state. And then they get a lot of uh, things because of the DREAM Act that put people who are not necessarily, or they're, they're of questionable documentation. They get put in the front of the line before the kids who are actually in the state whose parents are paying the tax dollars to get them to have a UC system available to them, and they're last in line. And so, and, you know, then, that, if you, and then if you happen to have too much um, uh, Caucasian heritage, then you're, you're further back in the line. So it's completely well, upside it's ridiculous. Down. We ought to have a merit-based system, and, and we ought to have spots for California kids. When I came here from out of state, they said, you know what, we've got a, we've got a waiting period. You can't get into UCLA. So I wound up at UCI. I became an anteater because I was going to come to California. I wanted to get out of Michigan. But they protected the California citizen. Mm -hmm. Now they're giving those spots away to mm -hmm. people because they can pay the full full boat. But did you know the, the cost of administration at the schools has gone up 16% a year for like the last 15 years? We, we need to get the costs under control. We need, we need to get these government unions under control. Just take, just take our prison system. Mm -hmm. Every common sense thing that anybody would do, and, and of course, I hate to use Texas as an example, but, but two years ago, Texas had the exact same number of inmates that California has. They don't have any unionized government workers in their prison system. So they were able, over a 15-year period, to reduce their costs by 15 to 20 percent a year. And now they incarcerate the same number of, of criminals for almost a third of what we do. They, they are at 2.7 billion. We pay over 10 billion for that same number of prisoners. We're so overcrowded that this, this uh, three judge panel has forced us to release inmates and everybody's heard of AB 109, the government, governor's answer to it. Mm -hmm. So we've got criminals being released into our communities. Mm -hmm. Well, geez, why didn't, why didn't we use some common sense and, and deport all of the illegals who are at least the ones who aren't murderers, send them back to their home countries. If we're gonna release them somewhere, Let's put them on the streets of the countries they came from rather than in our neighborhoods mm -hmm. and in our communities. Right. Why don't we release those, do medical paroles for, for the ones that are so sick they can't harm anybody? That There's more space you could clean up. Right. And, of course, we cut off the ability. I, I ran a bill to safeguard and, and, and extend the sunset indefinitely of the ability to send prisoners out of state. We can incarcerate them for half the price. But the prison guard union wanted to protect those California jobs mm -hmm. and and ultimately they they killed any common sense reform and now the governor's facing dumping another 9,000 criminals. Because 40,000 wasn't enough? I, I guess not. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Just open up the doors and let everybody out? I, mm -hmm. I think most Californians can't understand why we have the highest taxes and yet our freeways are falling apart. Right. Our school system is perennially underfunded. Mm -hmm. When it comes to criminals, we want to let them out on the streets and, and have them in your neighborhood mm -hmm. instead of putting them behind bars where, where they belong. Right. Yeah. It, it's madness. And it, it makes no sense to anyone that's trying. Curiosity, though. Uh, people say, well, you know, Governor Brown's done a great job. He's balanced the budget. But what, what could be wrong? I mean... But people aren't aware of, of how the records are kept, and that if you that if you keep the 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 negative balances in a separate set of books to make your uh, balances look like they are even, that that doesn't mean you have a balanced budget. You know, it's funny the obsession that this legislature and this governor have with what they call sustainability when it comes to the environment. Yes, when it comes to the economy. The overspending that they engage in, and they spend about a dollar eighty for every dollar they raise in taxes, is completely unsustainable. The budget is a big fat lie. Mm -hmm. There are so many different hidden deals that are that are taken off the books, and people wonder why we don't get what we pay for. Mm -hmm. There, there's a lot of people out there that really don't mind paying more in taxes if we got what we were paying for. But we're investing a hundred billion dollars in a in a, in a in a train. 
that's going to be empty that goes from nowhere to nowhere and, and yet our classrooms are are a disaster mm -hmm. and 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 there's only a fraction of the dollars actually reaching the kids yes and and that's that's where most people i think would would like to see their the, the resources put mm -hmm. is let's fix the roads yeah let's let's fund the schools and and fund the music and art programs and the sports programs the the the, the kids need something to do mm -hmm. you, you know you those things actually help improve math scores and reduce crime cost as well. Well, so. it gives kids something to wake up in the morning because they know they're going to go do something fun at school, but that, but it also encourages learning. We've cut all the ROP programs where, where kids learned how to how to how to do, um, you know, actual trades uh, like like working on cars or, or manufacturing. My brother's a teacher in an ROP program. They're constantly struggling for money. Um, and, and these are programs where you can actually have kids who may not have an intention of going to college at all or at least not for some time, actually be able to contribute to society as soon as they come out of high school. Yeah, I have a son who's in who's in a, uh, a graphic design class, and he's learning all these amazing skills. And he comes home, and he used to draw on paper. Now he's learning how to draw on a computer. Yeah. Well, that's a you could create a, a a career out of that. Right. And and you know that's the other thing. Everybody's trying to get a job, but we really need young people to find a career right and, and something they can do that'll sustain them their whole lives and then there are the fundamental skills math reading uh, where I'm talking to colleges who say 40 percent of their their incoming freshmen need remediation before they can even get to a level where they can perform in the in the school in, in the first place we're failing the kids on so many levels but the state as a whole is failing and so we've got just over two minutes left what would what would be uh, examples of some of the laws that you would remove when you're talking about removing laws that scares people and where would you cut some of the waste well if I was the governor mm -hmm. I, I would start with the regulatory climate the governor brings in 3,000 appointees okay. I'll give you an example the car board California resources board that board right there has <laughs> destroyed so many jobs <laughs> yes with idiotic regulations that don't protect the air and they don't protect the based environment. Based on false science, if anything. They use junk science to justify it. So what, what I believe we need is regulation with representation. Let's put real members of real companies from real industries that are affected, put them on the board, put them in power. They will counterbalance these environmental zealots who come out of Berkeley and UCLA. And But these are people with real world experience. What you'll get is you'll get laws and regulations that make sense. And you'll get the industry to buy into them because they were part of crafting them. And they will actually work so you can protect the environment without destroying the economy. Okay. Well, we've got about a minute left. Um, I, and I want people to be able to find you so they can research you, so they can keep an eye on you, <laughs> and so they can learn more about what you're up to. You're very active on Facebook. Where else can they find out information Absolutely. about you? Absolutely. Uh, I have a website. It's just electtimdonnelly.com, and that's... Donnelly is D-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y, so electtimdonnelly.com. And, of course, you can find me on Facebook. Okay. And so then they can find out when you might move from exploring a gubernatorial race to actually going prime time and everything else by tracking those ways. Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to connecting with as many people as possible who really care about California because I believe California is worth fighting for. And together... We can make this the freest, greatest, most prosperous state in the union again. Great. Thanks for sharing, Tim. If you hold on for just a moment, we'll be right back after a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. 
We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. Welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. And one of the things that they do in addition to underwriting the show, which we appreciate tremendously, is they are no best known for their speaker series. And that happens at 432 Stirland Road, right here in Mountain View at the FES Portuguese Hall. It's about literally three minutes away from the studio. And this evening, the speaker is Steve Forbes, along with Elizabeth Ames, and they're co-authors of the book Freedom Manifesto. In September, Elizabeth Nixon will be speaking, and she is the author of Ecofascism. And then in October, we will be joined as well uh, by uh, the founder of JihadWatch.com. In closing for this evening, I just want to remind you that, yes, California does have its share of issues right now, but there are people that are trying to make a difference. There are things that are happening at the assembly level, and as Tim alluded to, uh, there are people that are looking to run for governor that will take a different approach to the downward death spiral that we're all experiencing currently, but it's going to take you getting involved and holding these politicians accountable and making sure that your voice is heard. So reach out to Tim if you see other candidates that are out there as well. Ask them questions. Ask them hard questions. Make sure that they know what you think is important to you. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. On, on the right side, I've been your host, Chris Pareja, and I look forward to seeing you in person or on the show again sometime soon. Thanks again.